Hello, welcome to a continuation of my series on convolutional neural networks in ML5.js. The last time I recorded one of these was February 24th, 2020. It is now uh, October 2020. I would like to keep this mask on for the entire recording of this video, but I cannot because it fogs up my glasses and I can't see anything. <laughs> And fortunately, I'm in a hermetically sealed room here by myself uh, where it is safe for me to take off my mask. So I'm sorry that it took me so long to get to continue this series, but I'm very excited to do it with you today. I kind of spent the last half an hour like re-watching this video and getting myself centered to where I am and where I want to pick up with now in this video tutorial. The first thing I want to highlight for you is that I made a couple errors in the previous video when I was discussing how the resolution changes from layer to layer within a convolutional neural network. I was kind of off by one or two or maybe by a power of two here and there. Thank you to Return Exit Success, who eight months ago pointed out that that 28 by 28 image actually becomes 26 by 26 when the 3 by 3 filter is passed over it, leaving out all the edge pixels in the new processed image. Additionally, Luis points out here that the resolution, the total number of pixels, is reduced by a quarter, not by a half. Because if the width is reduced by half and the height is reduced by half, the pixels being the width times the height are reduced by one quarter. Thank you for saying I'm awesome too. I mean, I don't know. Ah, that's nice. That's nice. I appreciate it. When I watched the video again this morning, I discovered that I promised some things at the end. And so I'm here to deliver on that promise. And the first thing that I'm going to do is take the example from train a neural network with pixels, which didn't use convolutional layers, and update that example to have convolutional layers, and just look at how the code is different and see if it performs differently at all. As a reminder of what this example does is this takes a low resolution 10 by 10 uh, image from the webcam and I've already trained the model to recognize it as label A when I'm standing in front of the camera and label B when I move away from the camera. So ultimately, this kind of simple binary classification with very clear <laughs> distinctive images works fine without the convolutional layers. But let's try something a little bit more sophisticated. Could we perhaps get it to recognize whether I'm wearing my mask or no mask? And let's add convolutional layers to this example and see how that works. I should also quickly mention that there have been some updates to the ML5 library since the last time I recorded, and you'll want to make sure you have version at least 0.6.0. That's the version I'm using for this particular demonstration. The first step for adding convolutional layers to your ML5 neural network is to change the task. So the task that I'm going to specify is image classification. I should probably point out that convolutional neural networks are not limited to working with images. They're super effective for lots of other kinds of data, and I would certainly like to get into that at some point and look at some other examples. But a primary uh, use case is image classification. ML5 knows how to work with images, so this is kind of our starting point. So the, the terminology, the friendly term, if you will, to having convolutional uh, layers in your ML5 neural network is specifying the task as image classification. Other thing I need to do is be much more specific about the input data here. So with a regular neural network in ML5, it was just about the number of inputs. Were there three? Were there 104? Whatever number you might pick based on your data. Here, I'm going to be sending in images. So I need to tell ML5 what are the dimensions of the image, width and height, and how many channels does the image have? Is it an RGB or RGB alpha image? Is it a grayscale image? And in working in P5, generally, uh, it's going to be a, well, it's up to me to specify the resolution of the image. In this case, it's 10 by 10. Let's up that resolution to 64, 64 by 64. So I'm going to say in an array, 64 comma 64 comma 4, because the pixels of the images that I'm going to pass in have red, green, blue, and alpha values. Ultimately here, the alpha information is useless because I don't have any transparency in the images, so I might want to filter that out, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. I'm just going to let it be 64 by 64 with four channels. I'm noticing here that it says outputs three, and I, I kind of don't remember <laughs> why that's there. Um, I probably, when I was doing this the last time, I knew in my head like, oh, I'm gonna have three labels, three possibilities. But actually, uh, ML5 will quite nicely uh, figure out how many outputs there are in terms if, if, if it's a classification problem based on the data itself. So I'm just gonna take that out, and I've got inputs, image classification, and debug set to true because I wanna see the graph of the loss as it's going. 
Now, if you recall, I put almost no thought into the data collection interface. There is no interface. When I press the key A, that's saying these images are A, label A. When I press the key B, these images are label B. So I'm going to keep that model, but I do need to now adjust this add example function. The nice, wonderful thing about the fact that I've specified it as an image classification problem is ML5 knows how to work with P5 images. Or, or raw pixel data. Both are possible, but I'm just going to, since I have a P5 image, I'm going to use the P5 image. So rather than have to loop through all the pixels and kind of normalize the data myself, I could do something much more simple. So I'm actually going to remove all of this processing of the pixels and the input itself, which is really a single uh, input image, I'll call it input image, is uh, I need to make it an object and the property, I'll just name it image. And the image that I want to send in is the video itself. Then for the target, the training target, I'm going to also just be consistent and make this an object called label. Uh, and that will actually be the label itself. One of the nice things, by the way, I can do in JavaScript here is well, I'm creating these object literals. I want to have a uh, object with property image and value video. Here, the property name happens to be the variable name of the value. So I can use an enhanced object literal, just makes the code a little bit shorter and cleaner. And I can just say uh, target equals curly brackets with label inside. So now uh, I just need to change this inputs to input image. And I now have my data that I'm using to train the model is the video image itself, as well as the target label, both wrapped into uh, objects. I also need to do the same thing in the classify video function because that's where I'm also sending an image into the model for a prediction. So I can actually just remove this entire bit of code and replace it with that same object literal and pass that in. All right, I'm gonna try to run this. <laughs> I'm really not so confident it's going to work. And there's more that I want to say about this, a couple things I want to add to this example. And then there's going to be another video where I think it would be a really excellent demonstration to show a use case where I've collected essentially a, a database of images that I want to use to train the model. But let's, let's just uh, run this and see what happens. Okay, well, first of all, I'm seeing the uh, image being drawn as 64 by 64. Let me change the way I'm drawing the image. I don't think I need to draw every single pixel individually as a rectangle here uh, in this use case. So I'm going to take this out and just um, draw the video itself um, and stretch it out over the width and height of the canvas. It's important to realize that I've actually still set the image to be 64 by 64. So that's what's actually being passed into the machine learning model here. But we're seeing a higher resolution version of the image um, stretched out over the canvas. I'm going to try exactly what I did before, which is Every time I press the key A, I get a new training image with label A. Now I'm going to step away and give it a bunch of training images with label B. And then when I press T, it trains the model. That didn't seem to work so well. So then I'm glad that happened because this is inevitably going to happen to you. Something went wrong because the loss is not going down. In fact, the loss is like above between four and five, which are very high numbers for a loss. So I was just doing some debugging to try to figure this out. And I downloaded the data. The ML5 neural network saves the data from your training data set. And I looked at it and I thought, Oh, I forgot to normalize the data. So all of these numbers are all pixel values between 0 and 255, which makes sense. That's the way pixels are stored in P5.js. But I need them to be normalized between a range of 0 and 1 for the neural network to work. So right before I train the model, I need to add one line of code to normalize the data. So I'm hoping this fixes it, but it remains to be seen. I could have reloaded the data I saved previously, but I'm just doing it again, just to do it again. I say my model training prayer, and then I press T. Ah, that's a loss function I like to see. A, B, A, B. So there's a live chat going while I'm recording this right now. And the question comes up, can't you add the normalizing layer? And so first of all, the normalizing, uh, at, the normalizing data is not a layer of the neural network. It's sort of like a pre-processing step. And that could be something that ML5 just always does by default. But there are some cases where you don't want to normalize the data or you want to normalize the data in your own way. And so that's explicitly something you do have to call with ML5. But it's an interesting question whether or not ML5, the library itself, should change the way it works. But for now, 
now I do have to call it. So this worked and ultimately it's the same exact result of what I had in the previous video. So why are we even here? So I would like to make the case for you why you might want to use the convolutional neural network uh, functionality in ML5 beyond just the regular neural network stuff. So one is that it's my suspicion here that if I gave it a much harder problem, <laughs> more complex images with less obvious distinctive differences to classify that the convolutional neural networks are gonna perform better. Um, this was such an easy case of like, am I standing in front of the camera or not? It's only two classes. So it, we're not really seeing a difference. So I might try it with my mask. That might be a slightly harder problem. The other thing you might be wondering is, well, why are we even doing this when we have this whole system about transfer learning? I mean, after all, this is basically exactly the examples for from the teachable machine videos. Well, uh, in truth, if what I wanted to do was quickly whip up an image classifier that's like recognizing some gestures and movements if I'm in front of the camera or not in front of the camera or a particular object, using transfer learning and teachable machine will get me probably better, more accurate results more quickly. But there, there are a couple reasons why you might not want to go that route. One is maybe you don't want your model to be based on any pre-existing model or data set. Um, you don't want to use mobile net model that which was trained on the ImageNet database as part of what you're doing. Also, maybe the images you're using really have nothing to do with the sort of everyday objects that the mobile net model was trained on. So for example, if you're trying to recognize drawings or circuits or some kind of obscure specific design pattern, that's not something you see like scissors and phones and remote controls and coffee cups, right? Then that transfer learning approach isn't going to really help you because the data of the, of the pre-trained model that you're basing on does not match your current data. And that's what I'm gonna show you in the next video where I wanna look at doodles and shapes and other kinds of data that just aren't sort of photographic images from everyday life. But here, let's just make the case that this is gonna work a little bit better and let's see if I can get it to work, do the mask and no mask. So let's add some more specific labels here in the key press. So if I press the key uh, M, then I'm going to add an example with the label mask. And actually the labels, this is a little bit silly, like, but cause I could just like code it to like say a message when it sees a certain label, but the labels could be just any arbitrary string. So the label is going to be nice mask for when I'm wearing it and keep others safe, wear your mask for when I'm not wearing it. All right, let's see if we can get this to work. So let's first do the no mask. Now on with the mask. All right, hopefully that's enough data. Let's train the model. Wow, that's some wacky loss, but it looks like it figured it out. Hey, it likes my mask. Oh. Oops, I didn't really think about the design here. <laughs> okay, I uh, fixed the layout. So now it will tell me to put on my mask uh, if I am not wearing it. So here I am wearing my mask, sitting at my computer, and I take it off and it tells me to put on. So this is great. Our convolutional neural network, there's no transfer learning, there's no base model. This was all done in the web browser, in P5.js, with ML5, amazing. Ah, all right. Before I go from this video, I want to just return to this model summary panel in the debug view when you're training the model. So this is ordinarily like the part that I maybe try to stay away from a little bit, the model architecture, the lower level details. But I think it's really important to make the connection between these layers and the diagrams that I showed you in the previous two videos about what is a convolutional neural network. And we can see right here the convolutional layers, the pooling layers, um, and then the flattening, the flat layer and the final um, output label. And you can see that there's two um, outputs because there's a probability confidence score for mask and one for no mask. So that would be a higher number if there were more categories. But this is the default architecture that ML5 will make when you say image classification. And it's actually possible for you to configure this yourself to say how many convolutional layers you want, to say how, uh, how big you want the kernel, the filter kernel to be, how do you want to do pooling, what is your stride, all of those parameters that I mentioned in the previous videos are configurable here. So if this isn't working for you or you just want to play and experiment, let me show you how to do that. 
In the ML5.js reference, you'll find a section under neural network for defining custom layers. And this is where you can actually configure individually the number of layers and what those layers do in an ML5 neural network. So this is the default set of layers for a classification, the default set of layers for regression. And I want to look down here at this default image classification layers. All you have to do is create an array called layers, fill that array with objects that include the various details for each layer. So let me copy this to the clipboard, go back to my code, and I'm gonna, right here in setup, right before options, I'm gonna paste that in. So now I have a variable that's holding on to the custom layer configuration. And I'm gonna go down to my ML5 neural network and I'm gonna add a property, layers, custom layers. So here, I have the input dimensions, the task that I'm doing, I want to debug it while I'm training, and now the custom configuration for the layers. And I could start to experiment with this. And you can see here in this array, my first layer is a convolutional layer. I wanna have eight filters, a kernel size of five and a strides of one. I haven't talked too much about activation functions and what's this kernel initializer. So these are, I'll try to put some resources in the video's description where you can read up more about some of these other properties that you can experiment with. But again, this is the size of max pooling. Maybe what would happen if I did it uh, three by three and change the number of strides along the X and Y axis. Um, and you can see one thing, there's two, the thing that I think that's important for me to point out is there are two convolutional layers. And as the resolution is decreasing, the number of filters is increasing. Not a blanket rule, but that's one way to approach this, uh, approach architecting your model. Um, trial and error is your friend here. Experimentation, uh, talking to somebody else who knows about convolutional neural networks or has tried it before to get some advice about what might work well for you in your particular scenario. I encourage you to experiment with that. Leave your feedback and things you tried in the comments. And in the next video, I am going to look at a convolutional neural network that is trained off images of shapes squares, circles, and triangles, so that I could create something where maybe I'm drawing on a piece of paper and the neural network guesses, did I just draw a circle, a square, or a triangle? And then later, I'm also gonna show you some pre-trained convolutional neural networks that are in ML5, like DoodleNet, which is trained on a whole lot of uh, drawings from the Google QuickDraw dataset to recognize various kinds of doodles. And these are scenarios where using your own convolutional neural network really makes sense because it's the kind of data that we're working with, drawing and shapes and abstract geometry isn't something that the original mobile net model, image classification model, was trained on, so transfer learning doesn't necessarily apply. And also, there are some reasons why you might want to train your model from scratch with only your own data, and you have a real sort of control and understanding of how that data was collected and how that model's being used, as opposed to a situation where you're doing transfer learning and basing your model off of a pre-trained model that you might not know as much about. Okay, so uh, I hope I'll see. Hope that next video won't take a year to come out, uh, but who knows what's coming next in uh, 2020 into 2021. I hope good things for you, and I will see you in a future uh, ML5 uh, video. If you're watching this in years into the future, well, there's a little bit of history for you, a history lesson. I don't know what I'm, where I'll be doing or what you're doing, but I, I'm glad that you're here and that I'm here with you in this sort of virtual mediated way. All right, see you soon. Goodbye.